Good morning, church family. It's good to see all of you. Brett Brewer, I invite you to come on in. I see you talking <laughs> out there. <laughs> Let's all stand up together as we start off our morning in worship. <clears throat> I'm going to read from Psalm 92 to, to start us off this morning. <clears throat> Psalm 92, this is the word of the Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Let's all sing uh, this morning. Let's sing together as we start off our morning in worship. Your name is higher than the 
Good morning. Good to have every one of you with us this morning. Wonderful, powerful, merciful, and beautiful. Pretty, pretty awesome, huh? We got a chance to be together today to, um, to experience that in a special way, not just on our, on our own, but with each other as we sing and share together. Um, as I was driving up here to uh, church this morning with my wife and my grand- granddaughter, I was thinking this is a special Sunday because it's super bloom, okay? <laughs> super bloom Sunday, okay? All the flowers are out there. Everything is out there now. Super bloom, and I thought, how beautiful you are. You can't look at those flowers that are packed on the freeway. When you get there, if you don't drive the freeways a lot, get out there and take a peek. It is beautiful, and it reminds us of our wonderful, wonderful Savior. Welcome. If you're a visitor here, we we are so glad to have you with us today. And uh, take a chance and a moment here just to say hello to somebody next to you. Glad you're here. Take a chance. Take a chance. Can you guys... uh, Break that one out. Take a chance. Take a chance. You guys, have you heard that song? Take a chance. Yeah, yeah, okay. Is that Abba? Who is it? Yeah. Is it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. What time do you leave? Right after church. Oh, right. All righty, we'll get through some awesome announcements here. Awesome announcements. Super six, I mean supper six. We've got, and if you have not been a part of these yet, ever, um, really want to encourage you. These are our supper six. This is our last day to sign up. Uh, Christy and Donna are putting everybody together, right, this week. Um, and and you, if you want to see Christy Wood up here, she's, are you going to be back there? For sign-ups, for sign up for Supper Six, uh, we're going to have three couples to, uh, in a group, and and we, we really, it's just a great time to be together. And um, you don't have to worry about, gosh, do I got to do this every week? You, you, when you get together with your group and you're paired up, it's going to be one where you're going to figure out what works best for you and in, in in the in the group of people that you're with. And you take turns and you rotate around, and it's really a great time to to get connected a little bit deeper, a little bit more you know, than maybe just coming on Sunday. So maybe start there. If you're not really connected in any, in any place in a home group yet or anything else, try this out there. You get some good food. Um, try your favorite recipe on somebody that you've never know, that you don't know very well, you know. That's a good chance. Just do something like that. But um, just a good way to connect. Check today. You can, and also in the QR uh, code in your bulletin as well. And then we also have on every month, month we have our monthly marriage tune-up with Chris and Sue are handling that. You guys still hanging tough? Doing good? Okay. Right on? They, they, okay, good. All right. All right. Good, good deal. Doing that, and um, that's, I've just been hearing neat things about that uh, every week. It's a great opportunity to, to meet the, our care team, and there may be some people that you know that would be really benefit from that opportunity as well to be plugged in, and just maybe there's just an acute issue that they have in their in their lives that they would like to just man get some help and I don't know about you but when you've talked to somebody that's dealing with or working through some of the same challenges and struggles as you are it's just just hearing and knowing that you kind of go oh not alone I'm not the only one that, that's that's wrestling with the toilet seat up or toilet seat down you know what I mean and 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 there's bigger issues than that obviously a lot bigger issues but that's just a, a starter okay um Check with Sue and Chris if you're interested in that. Take her away. All right. Thank you. (laughs) All right. We have our men's breakfast coming up this Saturday, February 18th from 8 a.m. to 9.30 here at the church office. Um, I guess it's not really a church office anymore, huh? It's the church. It's the church. We built this. All right. If you have questions, you can ask Eric Richardson um, or Scott Huffman. 
Um, and then we also have some high school ministry announcements. So they're going to be going to Mexico this summer from June 25th to the 30th. They're going to be going down to Tijuana to build homes for people that don't really have homes. Um, and these homes are just small little squares, but it means a lot to those people that don't have anywhere to live. Um, it's open for families to join. Anybody 14 and over can come. Um, the cost is $425. That might seem like a lot, but it is going to cover building costs and any other things for the homes as well as other trip expenses. Space is limited, so if you're interested, please sign up ASAP um, on our app, or you can talk to Nathaniel King or Andrew Manzari. Andrew will be out at the table after church for questions. Um, the high school ministry is also hosting hosting another uh, movie night. It's going to be a fundraiser for the Mexico trip to raise some money. And that's going to be March 11th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. I don't know if they've, oh, they're watching Sing. So if you like that kind of movie, that would be great to come. It's going to be here in the Is parking lot. Is that the one where the flying pig? Yes. Okay, got it. Yep. Oh, that was good. We, we, that, that was fun. That was a fun one. You'll want to bring your family, friends, kids, anything, um, or anybody, maybe your neighbor. Just invite them. That'll kind of maybe get them um, their foot in the door for church. You can invite them to movie night and then be like, you've been here, so come to church now. <laughs> and it's $5 a person or $20 for a family bundle. And there's a $1 for a raffle ticket, so you get to win some cool prizes. Nice. Family bundle, that sort of sounds like internet service. Sorry. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Hey, uh, if our ushers could come on forward, we're going to take our offering. This is just for our, um, our family members that, that are part of here. If you're a guest, we don't want you to contribute. We're just really glad that you're here today. Just a quick mention, too, is we have in, in, our, um, in the bulletin, we have a contact card. If you'd like to, if there's some needs that you have or you want to get registered as uh, just kind of a, uh, to be on our um, our church newsletter or updates. Um, don't don't hesitate to do that. When, when I was looking at this again this morning, I, I just thought, thought it says, add me to the church email updates and prayer list. And that's a great way. Um, during the week, our, our elders are shooting out a, a prayer list, a prayer need of, of kind of needs that come up during the week. And it's a great thing when we're in the heat of the battle out there doing our doing whatever we're doing. Um, it's great to have that that prayer um, prayer. Uh, requests dropped into our onto our phones, and we can take the time, and it's kind of re kind of gets you connected again in some ways to pray for those that are hurting, those that are struggling, those that have some issues. So I really want to encourage you if you haven't had a chance to put your to get updated, put get an update, uh, fill this out, and then get yourself on that on that prayer update list, and it'll be uh, probably a real way of encouragement. As well as if you guys, if anybody has some prayer requests and some needs, you can p uh, put that on here as well, dump it in the. Um, in the back or in the in the offering basket um, as it goes by. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for who you are. You're wonderful. You're powerful. You're so merciful and you're beautiful. We we uh, look to you so many times in in our need, and we just say thank you for um, invading our lives the way you have. And I pray for especially for those that are hurting and struggling today that you would be with them, that they would sense an, a sense of encouragement and hope of eternity today, that, that, that uh, the problems of today would be, would be minimized in, the, with, in, in light of eternity with the hope that we have because of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for each one of us. Thank you for the resources that you've given to us so we can give back to extend the, the footprint of your kingdom in, in our little world here and, and, and beyond with the missionaries and the people that we have the privilege of supporting and praying for in very, very many different ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's all stand.
to play a short video. So uh, please be seated. Really, this, this is what knowing God is about. You gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta wear the right shoes. That's what God is concerned about. It'll drive you crazy. Can I, can I choose the background music? I think for a, a big chunk of the first, I don't know, 20 years of my life when I could start thinking, if there was a bubble coming out of the back of my head telling me what I was thinking, it would probably be something like, really? That's it? There's got to be more to life than this. I was raised in a Jewish home uh, on uh, Long Island, suburbs of New York City. And our family was very strongly culturally Jewish. We went to Hebrew school, we learned about Jewish culture, we learned about participating in Jewish worship. I love the music, I love the sound, I love the prayers, what they meant. Um, and I, I, I really wanted to learn all that I could about it because it was so pleasant and it, and it promised to connect me to God, and yet it never did. It was always a disappointment. My family was not necessarily all that religious, um, but I started taking Judaism really quite seriously. And so I, I started studying Judaism a lot on my own. And uh, when I was 15, I remember, um, the uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This was the day that I was gonna finally connect with God. I was gonna fast, I was not gonna drive in the car, I was gonna say all of the prayers, I was gonna confess all of the sins, I was gonna get it right so that finally I would connect to God. I did everything exactly the way you're supposed to do it. And it didn't work. I was walking home and I thought, it didn't work. God seems just as far away as he was 24 hours ago. And I was walking along and I looked down, I was dressed up in a suit and I wore dress shoes and I went, oh no, you're not supposed to wear leather shoes on Yom Kippur. That's what the rabbis taught. And I thought, ah, oh, that's it. That's why it didn't work. I wore the wrong shoes. I gotta wait another whole year to get this right? That's crazy. Okay, God, you, you gotta show me how this works because I, I can't remember all of these millions of rules. This friend of mine invited me to go to his church youth group. I thought, I'm Jewish, we don't do church anything, we don't do church youth group. He said, listen, it's not a religious thing, it's just a fun thing. High school kids from our church get together, we do lots of fun things. And he said, the girls are cute. So I said, okay. So we're on this bus and we're going to the beach and some guy gets up at the front, the front of the bus and says, hey everybody quiet down, we're gonna pray. And he prays that the bus doesn't break down, that we have a great time at the beach and that nobody gets badly sunburned. And then he says, in Jesus name, amen. And I thought, these people are crazy. You don't bother the almighty with things like sunburn. They talked a lot about knowing God. They used this phrase about a personal relationship with God and they prayed as if he was right there and they, that, that they knew him. But, but I, I just I had to keep pushing it off because no, I'm Jewish, we don't do this Jesus stuff. First year of college for me was lots of fun, lots of parties, lots of beer, until this terrible, terrible night in the middle of my sophomore year. Uh, I lived in a high rise dorm uh, at college. I was up on the sixth floor and I knew the guys on the floor and one of the guys, um, crashed through the, uh, a window in a lounge and he, and he fell to his death. And it, it was just, it was so crazy, it was so upsetting. I remember sitting at his funeral thinking, okay, I, got, I, I, I can't just keep joking around, I gotta get some serious answers. And so I decided to read the Bible uh, again. N not just the Tanakh, but this time also that, that New Testament that those friends gave me. Um, I, I thought it was gonna be this totally foreign uh, Gentile book. It was very Jewish. This, this Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed that he always existed. He claimed that he could forgive sins. And, and his death was not just some martyr's death, but his death was to pay for sin, to connect people to God. 
I remember reading in Isaiah, that was my favorite book in the Tanakh, that it's not that God has separated himself from you. You've separated yourself from God. Your sins have made a separation between you and God. And when I read that when I was a sophomore in college, it all started making sense. And I remember sitting at my dorm room desk and I, it was something like a prayer. I didn't really quite know how to pray, but it was, um, thank you God that life is not pointless and meaningless and absurd. Thank you that there is meaning and it's in you, it's, it's found in you. When my mom was 71, she sent me this email, kind of out of nowhere. Um, I, I think I'm gonna read the New Testament. Okay. And she starts sending me all these emails with questions about Jesus. And then, and then um, I sent her a book, uh, Betrayed by Stan Telchin. Five years later, we're talking on the phone. She says, you know, I think I'm gonna have the same problem that that guy in the book that you sent me had, Stan Telchin. When I, when I tell my Jewish friends that I'm a believer in Jesus, I think they're gonna reject me. And I thought, did my mother just say, I'm a believer in Jesus? She did, my, my mother said that. Is that the end? I was not told that. Shalom. Uh, could you all please stand for the reading of the word? Uh, we're looking at, sorry, Psalm 118, uh, verses 19 through 24. Psalm 118, 19 through 24. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just repeat back to you your scripture that this is the day that you have made. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> and I pray that you would be with um, Jeff this morning as he speaks. Um, I just pray that you would uh, be with the people that are heading to Israel today. Um, and I just pray that this day is a day that uh, glorifies you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. And be seated. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Do you know somebody who just seems to be a natural problem solver? One of those people that just never seems to be that difficult or stressful. They just can solve problems. Um, they just look at something and the, the solution seems very natural to them and they just say, there you go. Here's the answer. My father is one of those people. It seems like he just quietly can assess a situation, look at something, and just say, well, clearly it's this. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's so obvious. Um, he, at 89, still does his daily Sudoku or Sudoku or however you pronounce that, puzzles that are very complicated, and does his crossword puzzles in pen and in ink. Um, and so he just has that knack in a faithful uh, man of God, um, I look up to him very much. But one example of this problem solving, I remember when I was a, a teenage boy, we were in a church that had just built a church building. And um, in the building, we were in the process of hanging the speakers uh, for the sound system. And the church had these wooden columns, these laminated beams that were, were pretty up each side of the building across in the high ceiling of the church. And so this group of men that gathered to install these speakers, and you had about half of them saying, I think we should put them on the wood beams sticking out. It would be much better sound. And then you had a group said, no, no, that's going to be ugly and too obtrusive. Let's put recess it off to the drywall, the side of the wall. And um, it may not be as good a sound, but it won't be as ugly. And so this tension and this battle was going on, and my father quietly just stood there and go, well, you know, 
if we mount them to the drywall first, see how they sound, it'll be much easier to patch the drywall than the wooden beam. Boom, mic drop. Everybody's just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. The controversy was over. The problem was solved. Not only the problem of where to put the speakers, but a little bit of discord between brothers. And that is the kind of person he is. And we're looking at this passage today in Romans 9. In fact, why don't you open your uh, Bibles to Romans 9. We're going to uh, read from there in a moment. But we've been talking about this problem, this problem of Israel. And we're going to look today at the ultimate problem solver. And it's probably not too much of a mystery who I am speaking about. The problem solver of Jesus. You know, we um, have talked about this problem of Israel. Paul doesn't actually use those terms, but what we're talking about is Paul seems to be addressing an objection, maybe some type of rhetorical question where people said, look, if Jesus really is the Messiah, why isn't all of Israel following him? Why aren't all the Jewish people? It's not even the majority of Jewish people following him, so that just doesn't seem right. And to make matters worse, not only are just some of the Jewish people following this Messiah, Jesus, but those filthy, dirty, unchosen people, the Gentiles, are following him in droves. That doesn't make sense. That's not the promise of Israel. That's not something that makes sense to us. And that has been labeled the problem of Israel. But what we've been learning over the last few weeks is it's not a problem at all. Paul says in Romans 9, 6, the declarative statement, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. He's saying there is no problem at all. This has been God's plan all along. It's just you that has failed to understand it. And he's making a distinction between ethnic Israel when he says those that are descended from Israel, the person Israel, Jacob, and those who belong to Israel currently, which is the spiritual Israel, those who have put their faith in Messiah Jesus, those who have possibly had genuine faith before Jesus and carried it through and recognized the fulfillment of God's promises through Yeshua, through Messiah Jesus. And we learned in the last few weeks as we were studying chapter 9 about God's sovereignty. It's his sovereign choice. He chose the nation of Israel because he's God, not because of something they did. When he gave his covenant to Abraham, he chose him and he chose Isaac, the son of promise, not the son of flesh, Ishmael. He chose them because of his sovereignty. N.T. Wright puts it this way. It's not about race, it's about grace. He also chose Jacob, who later became Israel, not the rightful heir or the obvious one, Esau, to carry out his purposes, who was the firstborn. Even before they had done anything, they were chosen before they were born. And this is all demonstrates God's sovereignty, his election. We've spent some time talking about this doctrine of election. And although it can be difficult to comprehend, the reality is we cannot deny it, even if we don't understand it. So as we look further at this chapter, at the end of chapter 9, maybe you've had a hard time understanding why the majority of Israel has not come to faith in Jesus. And that bothers you, and maybe even brings doubts to your faith. Maybe the problem of Israel is a real objection to the faith. Or perhaps you failed to see the importance of Israel in God's plan and understand how it fits into the new covenant and the church in the end times. Or perhaps you've uh, had a hard time struggling with the understanding of righteousness, the law, and faith, and what that means for us today. Well, this passage addresses that. Or maybe you've had a wrong understanding of works and righteousness and how God intended his law to be used. Well, hopefully this morning we can clarify some of these issues as we look at this passage. And we'll see today in this passage the root cause for this problem of Israel and why Jesus is such a hurdle for Jewish people and then discuss how Jesus himself solves the problem, not only of Israel, but of all humanity. Point one, the problem of Israel is from a lack of faith. 
Let's look at uh, Romans 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. When Paul at the beginning of this says, what shall we say then? It sounds like a question, but he's really, it's somewhat of a rhetorical question, and he's drawing a conclusion, and what's following is a statement of fact, not a question. And he says that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. Gentiles did not pursue righteousness, but have attained it. How is that possible? Well, part of it is what Paul means by righteousness. Some would call this what the uh, theologians would call forensic righteousness, or our standing with God, being declared righteous. Us being reconciled to God can stand before him and that that is what has been accomplished through Jesus. Is being reconciled to God in relationship with him, not some moral act of righteousness, not some morality we pursue, but something that we are declared righteous. And that's the righteousness Paul is talking about. The Gentiles have been reconciled to God, their creator also, not because of works of the law, but because of faith. And they have not pursued righteousness, but have attained it. They've become righteous, enjoyed that right relationship with God, all because of faith. And this actually is the first time, if you haven't noticed, that Paul mentions the word faith in chapter 9. And actually, he hadn't mentioned faith since early in chapter 5. And he's rebringing that idea of faith, being justified by faith and reconciled to God by faith now at the end of chapter 9. And God is calling large number of Gentiles to faith in him. And at a minimum, this would be very annoying to the Jewish person. And we'll see in chapter 11 that this is actually intended to make Israel jealous. This bringing of Gentiles is intended to make Israel jealous and point them to Messiah Jesus. And Gentiles had not been pursuing the law. In fact, it would be wrong of them to somehow think that they needed to live under the law, pursue the law, become Jewish, get circumcised, and then they can put their faith in Jesus. And for those of you that know the Bible, that's the whole purpose of the letter to the Galatians is to push back on that heresy that people must become Jews before they become, become Christians. Let's look at um, Romans 1, 16 and 17. This idea of faith and righteousness. This summary verse, our memory verse for the book of Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The Gentiles are living by faith and attaining the righteousness of God. And then we learn later in Romans in 3.21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on in verse 31 of chapter 9 to say that Israel has largely pursued righteousness by works and not faith. Verse 31, but that Israel who, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. So that phrase that is translated, law that would lead to righteousness, and some of your translations might say law of righteousness. And there's lots of different opinions about what this can mean, but I think it probably is best summarized by saying that they were trying to achieve this right standing with God, this reconciliation with God, righteousness, through the works of the law and not by faith. They did not view the law as just merely a moral code to become a better person. 
They would not be thinking that way, to be more fulfilled as our modern sensibilities might think. They viewed it as a, nat a natural and necessary part of their national identity to follow the law. And they didn't necessarily have to trust in God. They would just have to follow the law, and hopefully that would appease him and placate him, and they would not draw his wrath. We even saw this Jesus addressing the Pharisees that had a misunderstanding of the law. How many times that Jesus interacted with the religious leaders when he was on earth. And he would say things like, you think you're okay just not murdering following the law, but you hate your brother. It's the same thing. Or you think you're okay because you don't commit adultery, but yet you lust in your heart after a woman. It's the same thing. More about understanding the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. They would pursue the wrong things. They weren't successful in reaching real righteousness because they did not understand faith. Verse 31, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Israel has been so wrapped up in its national identity and as God's chosen people, pridefully coupling this with keeping the law circumcision, etc., thinking that that was all that was necessary. That's all they had to do. Not trusting in God, and they had looked right past Jesus and missed the Son of God himself. Paul talked about that in chapter 2 of Romans when he said to the Jewish people, and you do the same things, comparing to the sin of the Gentiles, because they followed the law, and yet they could sin apart from things that weren't in the law, and they would do things that were wrong. Paul goes on in verse 32 and asks, why? Why is it that Israel has not achieved righteousness? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. This isn't just any act of works. It's not just uh, replacing faith with a works of faith. Uh, excuse me, replacing faith with works. I don't think it's quite what he was saying. I don't think that we're seeing a works righteousness message here so much as their attempts to pursue the law was what was failing. Look at Galatians 2, 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. This word justification and justified is here. It's from the same root word that gets translated righteousness. If you remember, Nathaniel taught us several weeks ago, there is no English word for righteousify or righteousification. I think there should be, but there isn't. Um, so oftentimes justification and righteousness are talking about the same thing. Maybe we think oftentimes as justification is the process of us coming to faith, that we're justified as an event. But it's also the righteousness, we are standing justified before God. We are in right relationship with him. So does that, that raises the question, should the law be dismissed completely? Well, we'll look at that a little later, but definitely no, it should not. Paul actually talks about that later in Galatians 3.24, when he says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. God has a purpose for the law. The law was never intended to replace righteousness, but to show the holy character of God and to reveal the sin of man. It was not an end to itself. And Jesus came to do what the law could not do. Philippians 3, 9. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. But faith, producing righteousness, is not a New Testament invention. It has always been this way. Look at when we read Hebrews 11, chapter 11, what's been called the Hall of Faith. The writer of Hebrews describes Noah in this way. 11, Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And also remember in chapter 4 of Romans, Paul talks about Abraham's faith. 
how it was counted to him as righteousness. So Israel has been focused on the works of the law that they may have forgotten the most important thing, faith. Unwavering trust in the lawgiver, not the law. Too much pride in being the called that they have neglected to worship the one who is doing the calling. Paul is primarily talking about the works of the Mosaic law here in Israel. It is not just about any system of morality or any good deeds or works. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. He's specifically talking about Israel's reliance on the law. And this is the law that came from him on Mount Sinai, brought through Moses. There would be no better moral code. There would be no better works of righteousness than the law of God. So thinking about this, do do we tend to look at our own attempts at righteousness and being a good person? Or do we trust in the sufficiency of God's goodness and grace to to be brought into right standing with him, to be justified? Do we create our own system of righteousness, not even from God on Mount Sinai, and miss the importance that Jesus has accomplished it all? Do we confuse the good works that have been set before us as Christians and pursue them somehow thinking we're going to earn grace when we realize that's what we've been called to do. That's a way of worshiping and honoring God. Our standing in Christ is because of faith and not our attempts at righteous behavior. This should give us pause when we worship, to worship him for what he's done. May we with all humility confess that we are not adequate, and it is completely by his election, his choosing, his grace, that we can be reconciled to him. And remember, Paul isn't talking about generic faith. I think that's often how our culture talks about it. Well, just faith. He's a person of faith. Like, that's good enough. But really, it's the object of our faith. Who are we placing our trust in? That's the important question. It's not just any faith, but faith specifically in Messiah Jesus. God incarnate. And you know, it seems so obvious to us who are believers that Jesus is the Messiah. We read the Old Testament. It's kind of, this is just evident. He's all the way through the Old Testament, the Tanakh. For us Gentiles, that's the Old Testament. But it is baffling that the chosen people of Israel, the ones who've actually been called to preserve these scriptures, that constantly prophesy and declare and point to Jesus, have missed it. And that is because for the Jew, point number two, Jesus is a problem. Now, please don't quote that out of context because that can sound heretical that Jesus is a problem. But to the Jewish person and to all unbelievers, he presents a real problem. It's not just another parallel truths of other truths and we just kind of coexist. The truth of Jesus is a problem to everyone who doesn't believe. He presents a challenge that cannot be ignored and must be answered. What Jesus claimed about himself cannot be dismissed, and every person is presented with a dilemma to embrace it or reject it. That is a problem for those who do not recognize him as the Son of God. Paul later uh, in chapter 9, verse 32, is referring to Israel rejecting the Messiah. Let's read 932. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in a Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This sounds like an Old Testament reference, and you're right, it is. If you look in your footnotes, it is. And it may be, uh, be asking, well, what passage is he quoting? Well, Paul does something very un-Jewish here and very interesting. He's actually blending a few different Old Testament passages uh, from Isaiah, from Psalms, and Joel, perhaps, Some phrases that would be familiar, but he's blending a few different passages. In Isaiah 28, 16 is part of what he's quoting here. Therefore says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who's laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. The Jewish believer would believe this is talking about the Messiah, and yet they don't recognize that it's Jesus. And also in Psalm 118, 22, that we just heard, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
There's Old Testament references to Israel rejecting the Messiah, and here it is happening, and they don't even realize it. But then Paul does something interesting. He also blends in some quotes from Isaiah 8, 13, or Isaiah 8, 14 specifically, but let me read 13 through 15 in context. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So this part of chapter 8 is about judgment, about God's judgment against Israel. And it appears Paul is combining the passage that declares the Messiah with the judgment of Israel. So that's not only a problem, it is the problem. To the Jews, this Jesus is a rock of offense, a stumbling block. It can't be possible. We just heard the um, I Found Shalom video, Randy Newman, very entertaining guy. If you go to Chosen People Ministries' website or just Google I Found Shalom, you'll see a bunch of these videos. And I've watched several of them, and they're so encouraging. There's over 100 And there may be some people you even recognize in there. Um, But it is amazing how many, so many of these testimonies talk about Jesus as being a stumbling block. Oh, we can't even consider that based on their heritage, based on what they were raised. And they push it aside. They don't want to even consider Jesus because he's a problem. Look at verse 33. That Paul talks about in in Romans 9. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This theme of not being put to shame is also present in Joel chapter 2, 26 and 27. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Of that phrase, whoever believes in him will be put to shame. That's what Paul says in Romans 9. And he's drawing some of these things about not being put to shame, which is an interesting thing because uh, we might think of that as once we are justified, once we are righteously standing in the presence of God in right relationship with him, there is no shame. The shame of our sins have been nailed to the cross. All is forgiven. We don't stand in shame. The Old Testament is predicting that because of Jesus, we can be in the presence of God without shame. What a glorious thing that is. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Sounds like a good phrase. Oh, that's the Romans 1.16. The title of our series, Not Ashamed. Jesus talked about this rejection as well in Matthew 21, 42 through 44. Have you, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This is a serious and dire warning. We learned a few weeks ago when Nathaniel was teaching in Romans 9, talking about God's heart is for mercy. That's his desires for mercy. And the hardening of Israel is a problem. The hardening of Israel as they continue to turn their back on Jesus is a problem. And what Jesus is saying here, God's patience won't last forever. His patience with final judgment will not last forever. There will be judgment someday, and the stone that they stumble over will be the stone that creates judgment. Jesus also remains a stumbling block to the modern Jew, just like we talked about that video um, with Randy Newman. Um, Because of the pushback from community, the difficulty, they can be rejected. We have friends that came to faith in Jesus and Jewish people and have been ostracized from their family. It's a real thing. And yet, by God's grace, he is calling more and more Jewish people to him. And we, in fact, support ministry, Joseph and Sarah Ryan, that we've mentioned during uh, um, 
several services, are full-time missionaries with Chosen People Ministries. Their desire is to bring the gospel of Jesus to Jewish people. And it's just amazing how they've been oblivious to the stumbling block of Jesus. It's been such a barrier, such an offense to them. But I, you can understand from Randy's testimony, it's amazing. He's an educated guy. He was in college and he never looked at the New Testament, never even considered it. It has to be pushed aside. And they haven't even entertained or looked at that. And yet the word of God spoke to him, spoke to him through the word of God to reveal truth to him and bring him to faith. And that's a glorious thing, the power of the word of God. But Jesus is a stumbling block to the modern Gentile as well. Everyone must answer, well, what do you do about Jesus? He made some pretty outlandish claims. He wasn't just a good teacher, because if he was, he was kind of crazy. He said some things that were more than just being a good teacher. He said some things that equated him and declared that he was God. Well, what do you do about that? You know, it's popular in our culture to dissect Jesus, kind of smorgasbord Jesus or buffet Jesus. You kind of pick what you like and you walk past what you don't like and you choose who Jesus is instead of looking at the whole counsel of God and understanding who he is. And that Jesus that both saves and also is wrathful and will produce judgment is not a popular Jesus in our culture. And that is a stumbling block. That is something that we have to be able to address graciously and to be able to share his love with people without it being difficult. John 3, 16. I wanna, um, the question is then, why aren't the Jewish people coming to faith? And listen to what Jesus says. The very familiar verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The unpopular message. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. We, like Paul, may be grieved by the unbelief of others, loved ones, or people we know. And Jesus tells it's because we love darkness. The unbeliever loves darkness. All of us were there. Apart from Christ, we love darkness. We love evil. And the gospel message, by its nature, is offensive. It's offensive to the unbeliever by necessity. Jesus is a problem to the sinner who loves their darkness. We cannot dilute or weaken the gospel, trying to ease people into the faith or make it a little more palatable. We hear Jesus is all about love. He accepts you just the way that you are. No, he doesn't. He wants to transform you from somebody who loves darkness who can walk in the light. We diminish the holiness and the righteousness of God when we have a low and incomplete picture of Jesus. But we are called to be gracious and loving and winsome ambassadors for him. 1 Peter 3, 15 says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Do we really believe he is the answer for the world? For all Jews and Gentiles still, all corners of the world, all tribes and nations? Yes, we do. I hope this motivates all of us to be engaged in missions, engage not only people that we live around, but also to be engaged in spreading the word to people that haven't heard his good news throughout the world, to pray and to be participate in the Great Commission. So it can be discouraging, I think, when Jesus is a stumbling block to so many. So what's the answer? How do we put this all in perspective? The problem of Israel, 
the lack of faith by so many, the problems of the world, this fallen, difficult world that we see every day, the heartache. Well, there is a chapter break at the beginning of chapter 10, but the thought is continued by Paul. And that brings us to our third point. Jesus is the solution to all problems. Romans 10, 1 through 4. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Well, that verse 4 is pretty popular. A lot of people quote that, are probably very familiar with that. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone believes. But really, the theme of this paragraph is in verse 3. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And he's talking about Israel. And Paul will continue to elaborate on this through chapter 10. And this is kind of an introduction. And also when Paul says brothers, which actually can, it does mean brothers and sisters in Christ, he's not changing the theme. I think he's making things maybe a little more personal, a little more reflective as we talk about faith and righteousness in Christ. He also can, reiterates his concern for his fellow Jew. If you remember back at the beginning of chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, this is what Paul says. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Our evangelistic passion and mission as believers is informed and motivated by compassion for those who do not know Jesus. I think it's easy to look at them as enemies of God, people that are unbelievers, and look with judgmental eyes and derision and as rebels against God, not as fellow image bearers who without Jesus will be lost for eternity. Paul explains more about why Israel is not paying attention and has not recognized Jesus as Messiah. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God... I'm sure that would have been offensive to the Jewish person, being ignorant to the righteousness of God. And seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So Israel has fallen into the trap of being zealous for what they believe, but not necessarily evaluating how true it is. Paul talks about his zeal and his testimony before becoming a Christian, a follower of Jesus. In Acts 22.3, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. In Galatians 1.14, he says, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Paul understood the trappings of misdirected and poorly informed zeal. To the Jew, they would think back to Phineas, mentioned in the Torah, in Numbers. Phineas was held in his example of a zeal where he defended Israel and was commended by God. Numbers 25, 11 says this, and this is God speaking. Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites since he was as zealous for my honor among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. So they would be thinking they would like to be like Phineas, to have this zeal that would be pleasing to God. But unfortunately, in their zeal to reject Jesus, they're misinformed and they have the wrong zeal. But it may be causing them to double down and dig deeper in the hole. Let's revisit verse 4 in chapter uh, 10, uh, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So some may look at this and says, well, the law is over, it's done away with, it's unimportant. And that's not what Paul is saying here, When he, the word that gets translated, end. The law served its purpose for God's prescribed time, and understanding this is important. When Paul says the end, he is meaning this era has come to a close, but it's also that the law has been fulfilled in reaching its anticipated endpoints. 
its anticipated goals. It could also be maybe translated culmination, climax, or consummation. Not the end as in it no longer exists. Douglas Moo says it this way, For he, referring to Jesus, is its fulfillment and consummation, and he cannot be understood or appreciated unless he is seen in light of the preparatory period of which the law was the center. Jesus also had something to say about the law in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law, the entire Tanakh or Old Testament, it's about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It's about God accomplishing his redemptive plan. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all pointing to Jesus and his incarnation. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We run that same risk of being zealous, maybe for things that aren't informed by right knowledge. Instead of seeking truth in the word of God, we may preform opinions and seek a zeal that we think is for God that may not even be accurate. We should all take caution to do that. We should not be uncommitted and unconvicted in what we believe, but be careful and be humble. We do not hold as a church that the church itself has replaced Israel. We believe that God has a clear plan for Israel. But we also believe that Jewish people need to come to faith in Jesus. And once they have faith in Jesus, as Paul also says, are, there is neither Jew or Gentile. We are all one in the same body. We are not distinct or different, even though we have different heritages. We also look here that the law is not just a moral code, but was actually given to Israel by God for his specified purposes. However, we can also slip into a zeal about these things that don't really matter and pursue righteousness on our own making. But we know the problem solver, God, has solved all these problems, past, present, and future, even if we don't see it all yet. I was reflecting on what this idea of faith is in the law, and I think maybe in conclusion we can talk about, we can misconstrue that the law had all these rules, and now we only need one rule, faith in Jesus. And I think that would be a misunderstanding of faith. Not just one thing on the to-do list to check off, put our faith in Jesus. I, instead, I think genuine faith, when it comes, is that undeniable realization that there is nothing we can do but trust in Him. Trust in the sufficiency of what He has accomplished on the cross. Trust in the completeness of of this work and declare like Paul, your grace is sufficient. When the Spirit of God reveals to you that there is nothing you have earned, nothing you have achieved, nothing you can earn, nothing you can achieve, faith comes when we realize it's already been done. It's been done by God Himself, by Jesus on the cross. It is finished. The perfect sacrifice, complete in every way, ordained before we were born. He died for us while we were yet sinners. What we've seen today that the problem of the unbelieving Jew, the problem of Israel, is the same as the problem of all unbelievers, a lack of faith in God. We acknowledge that Jesus is a problem to the unbeliever and that the only solution is Jesus himself. In a moment, we'll continue to worship, and um, I want us to just meditate and worship on what God has accomplished what he is accomplishing, and with confident expectation or hope, can look forward to what he is going to accomplish through his people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just praise you today. We, we, we praise you for um, the faith that we have, Lord, and, and um, just the, the rest in you that you've accomplished what we cannot accomplish, Lord, and we praise you for that. We pray for the Jewish people, for Israel, um, that they will come and to see the real Messiah, Lord. And we just pray uh, also for all unbelievers that uh, through your spirit, will, truth will be revealed to them, that you will bring them to, bring them to repentance um, so they can enjoy the righteousness by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jeff. Let's all stand together.
What a precious thing to be washed in his blood. Um, praise God. So uh, thank you all for coming. If anybody here is a visitor, we'd love to chat with you. We have a welcome packet on the back. And also we have a prayer team that will be meeting over here. If anybody uh, desires uh, to be prayed with, we have a, a group of people that can do that. And we're, we uh, make that an important part of our Sunday morning gathering. And uh, have a great Sunday. God bless you. Amen.